somebody who's not going to children's church, let me invite you to find a Bible and open to Revelation. We're going to be in chapter 8 today. This is our ninth week in this study on Revelation. And as I've said many weeks, uh, this is not uh, necessarily a chapter that I would open up and say, I want to preach a sermon on this chapter today, because it's very difficult and very hard. And, and really, um, it's, a, it's a part of the Bible that we don't often read, because it is so difficult and so hard to read. Uh, but if we can gain kind of the flow of the story and the whole narrative of the story, I think it begins to make more sense. And so I'm going to encourage you, as I've encouraged you each and every week, uh, if you miss a week, uh, go online. There's a podcast. You can listen to the audio version or you can watch the video and you can catch up to where we are. And I think if you do that, I think it will make more sense as we keep going in the story. But with that being said, I want to do my best to bring everybody up to speed this morning. And for those of you who forget easily, uh, you'll appreciate being brought up to speed too. You got, where were we last week? I can't remember what we talked about. So I want to do that briefly this morning. We began our study in the book of Revelation back in July. And again, it's a daunting book, but there are some key ways that we need to understand Revelation. It really helps us interpret Revelation. First of all, we need to understand the genre that Revelation uh, is written in. I'll put this verse on the screen, Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the very, very beginning. And that Greek word, revelation there, is the Greek word apocalypsis. What does that sound like? Uh, apocalypse, right? And often we misunderstand that word. We think that word means the end of the world, and that's not at all what it means. It literally means to lift off a veil. So what's happening here? This apocalypsis, this revelation, is a peering into what is unseen. And when we look into something that is unseen or look into this other dimension as John is, is peering into, the things that we see, we have no way of making sense of them. We have no reference in our dimension. And so often, as we have these sorts of visions, they are communicated to us in this apocalyptic genre. And in this genre, we have symbols and images that help us to put our minds around what is really indescribable. Now, the first century Christians who would have first read this letter would have understood this genre. They had many writings in this genre, and they would have easily interpreted the, the symbols, the images. They would have known exactly what they mean. But for us, it's hard because we don't necessarily live in a world like that. We also need to understand that if we're going to understand Revelation, we need to understand the Christians in the first century, the context of the Christians in the first century. Now, if you go back to chapters 2 and 3, you can read the particular words that were written to particular churches. And that gives some context or helps us understand what's going on in those churches. So, two, two keys for interpreting Revelation. Number one, apocalyptic genre. And number two, the context of the first century Christians. So, here's John. As this verse says, he is exiled on the island of Patmos. He has a vision. He's instructed, instructed to write this vision down. And, and to summarize where we've been so far, let me just kind of walk through what we've experienced. John is able to peer into the throne room of God. There he experiences all sorts of strange images and creatures and angels and elders, people dressed in white robes. And there is a scroll a sealed scroll. And you say, well, what's the scroll? What's that all about? Well, the scroll is God's story or God's or his story. It's the way that history has been, the way that it is playing out, and the way ultimately that it's going to end. But there's a problem. There seems to be no one worthy to open the scroll. And as we continue to walk through the story, one was revealed as worthy. It was not the one that we might expect. Not a mighty warrior, but a lamb. A lamb looking as if he were slain. So if a lamb takes the scroll, we read in verse, chapter 5, verse 7, he came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And, and when he takes the scroll, everybody begins to worship him. 
They're singing songs about how He's worthy. They're proclaiming that it was His blood that purchased a people for God. And in Revelation chapter 5, verses 8 through 14, we have a beautiful picture of worship. So we're left here with this image of the Lamb at the center who is able to open the scroll. We're sitting on the edge of our seats. We're we're thinking, what's in the scroll? What's going to be revealed when it's opened? And maybe we're thinking there's going to be lots of beautiful things that come out of the scroll. But as we walk through the story and each seal is broken, death and destruction are a part of the mix. Pain and suffering. And we go, what is this all about? See, what's happening here is that evil is revealed in our world. And as we've talked about this, it's not just something that will be one day, but it is talking about what has been, what is happening, and ultimately what is going to happen. Evil is exposed, and we're left wondering, is God going to do anything about it? And then after the fifth seal was opened, we were exposed to those who were killed for their faith. The slain souls of the martyrs. And they're crying out. Look at at Revelation 6 verse 10. They called out in a loud voice. How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. They're then told they're going to have to wait. Now the sixth seal was no better. It seems that God turns the world upside down. We read of a black sun, a blood red moon, the sky falling seems like everything's coming apart. And then, what about the seventh seal? That would be next, right? Now, last week, we were held in suspense, weren't we? Instead of the seventh seal being opened, we saw four angels who seemed to be holding back a wind that was going to destroy the world. We read in chapter 7, verse 3, Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees. Until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. What's this all about? God is saying, look, the seventh seal is about to be opened. But before I do that, I want to seal my people. I want to protect my people. So that's what we talked about last week. God does not want his people to get caught up in the destruction. And so we've got this picture of a great multitude who were rescued by God. In fact, we read in verse, verse 9 of chapter 7, After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. What a beautiful picture. That's how chapter 7 ends. The Lamb at the center of the throne, the people of God rescued. Are are you with me now? You up to speed? You kind of in the story where we are? So with all this in mind, let's flip over to chapter 8 and let's read together this one. I'm going to ask Cheryl Flaherty to come and read. And we're going to read the first five verses and we're going to talk about them for just a bit. And then we're going to come back and read the remaining part of the chapter. And then we're going to talk about that just a little bit. So... Let's read together verses 1 through 5. And when he opened the seventh seal, there followed a silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels that stand before God, and there were given unto them seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood over the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should add it unto the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense and the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and he filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it upon the earth. And then there followed thunders and voices and lightnings and and an earthquake. All right. As usual, not easy to read or understand, is it? But, but, but let's walk through the story together. Have you ever been in a room with intense silence? I mean, so quiet that you could hear a pen drop. Maybe it was after the performance of a beautiful song, and everyone just left, or just sat in awe, and it just seemed inappropriate to clap. 
to make any sort of motion. I remember in 2004, after watching the movie, The Passion of the Christ, it was released that year, and we went to the theater and we watched it for the first time. And as the credits rolled during uh, the end of that movie, it was so quiet in the theater. No one got up. We just sat there in awe, in wonder. Now, there was some music playing, but other than that, it was dead silence. That's the kind of dynamic that we see in heaven here. John says, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Now, again, there's all sorts of symbols in Revelation, right? So we were talking in our family this week about what, what does that mean, a half an hour? And we finally just came down to it. Well, I guess it means a half an hour. <laughs> If I had silence in this room for one minute, it would begin to feel awkward in here, wouldn't it? If we did for five minutes, you would be thinking, this is kind of weird. But if we sat in silence for a half an hour, it would be profound, wouldn't it? I mean, it would feel like forever. It would feel like hours, wouldn't it? And so that's what John is saying here. Silence in heaven for a half an hour. Something big is about to happen. Awe, expectation, anticipation. The seventh seal is about to be opened. Everybody's holding their breath. How is it going to work out? The silence should clue us into the fact that something big is about to happen. But as we've experienced before in Revelation, it might not be what we might expect. And then in verse 2, we read of trumpets being distributed to seven angels. Look at verse 2. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now, seven is a good number. It's a number we keep seeing over and over again. But, but what are trumpets all about? Now, trumpets in the ancient world were used for various purposes. They were used in festivals. They were used in battles. You might remember the blast of trumpets in Joshua chapter 6, signifying what? The falling down of the walls of Jericho. But in a general sense, trumpets are used to announce, to warn, to kind of sound the alarm. This seems to be what's happening here. But before the trumpets are sounded, something else happens. Look at verse 3. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. Now, what was a censer? A censer is an instrument used to, uh, for incense. We don't really have these in our church today, but you might, if, you, if you've been in a Catholic church, you might know uh, an incense holder is a censer. And so that's what it is here. It was a temple, um, a piece of temple uh, furniture or an instrument used in the temple. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. So we have this incense burner and it is containing the prayers of the saints. Now that might seem really strange to us, but let's think about what we read a few chapters ago. The people of God in Revelation chapter 6, they've been killed for their faith, they're again there in heaven, and they are crying out in a loud voice in verse 10, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. So here are those prayers symbolized in this incense burner. And, and what happens next? Verse 4. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of the saints, there they are, went up before God from the angel's hand. So these prayers of the suffering saints are going up like smoke before God. And then in verse 5, Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. He took the censer, filled it with fire. Fire symbolizes judgment. And then, like a fastball, he hurls it to the earth. And what happens? There, there came thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Okay, you got this imagery in your mind? Incense, prayers of God's people going up, filling it with fire, hurling it to the earth. 
and all sorts of um, earthquake, thunder, lightning, all that stuff is going on. So with all this in mind, let's read what happens in the rest of chapter 8. Cheryl, come, come now and read verses 6 through 13. And the seven angels that had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And the first sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the earth was burnt up, and the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood, and there died the third part of the creatures which were in the sea, even they that had life, and the third part of the ships was destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell from heaven a great star burning as a torch, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of the waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, that the third part of them should be darkened, and the day should not shine from the third, for the third part of it, and the night in like manner. And I saw and I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven, saying with a great voice, Woe, woe, woe for them that dwell on the earth, by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels who are yet to sound. All right, thank you, Cheryl. Now, how many of you are cringing as we read this together? Why is God doing this? Now, this is his creation, and he seems to be destroying it all. The, the earth, the trees, the sea, its creatures, the rivers, even the sun, moon, and stars. Did God lose his temper here? What's going on? Has he flipped? Why is he doing this? Now, God knows what he's doing. And there is a reason. Let's consider the possible reasons why uh, chapter 8 is here for us. N.T. Wright in his book, Revelation, for everyone suggest at least three possible answers. And we're going to walk through these here. The first answer is that, that sin is serious. And that's what we're seeing here. Evil is in our world. And sin is a reality. Now sin is not something that we talk about very often today outside of church. That everyone seems to get offended if you use that word. But, but think about the evil in our world today. Think about the war, the terror, the genocide that's taken place in our world. Now we like to think of our world as a pleasant place. We, we like to ignore the ugliness in our world. Yet first century Christians would have had no problem with understanding that the world is filled with evil. Sexual sin, violence, total disregard for others is around every corner in the first century. And this image of a holy God coming in contact with a sin-soaked world reminds us that God is holy and that the world is full of evil. Now sure, it's God's creation, but it's been corrupted. Even back in Genesis chapter 6, you might remember in Noah's day, look at what it says here in Genesis 6, 6. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. Now, that's all the way back in Noah's day. That's all the way back in kind of the beginning of the story. And even then, we get this sense that the world is not as God wants it to be. It's sin-filled and sin-soaked. And maybe that's what we're seeing here in this chapter. Secondly, Wright suggests that we might understand at least parts of this chapter as imagery and symbolism. Now, if you spent any time in Revelation, as we have, you know that this genre includes symbolism. And maybe John is not saying that a literal third of the earth will be destroyed. Maybe he's talking in symbolic terms here. We do see that number a third over and over again. And maybe what John is telling us here is that like a diseased tree, 
The earth is going to need pruning. I have a tree in our backyard that is recently, all, all of the leaves have turned brown on that tree. And I don't know if it's alive or not, but I went out yesterday and I cut all the branches back and pruned that tree back. Now, it may be gone, but it may produce new life in the spring and pruning it back. Um, again, I'm not a gardener, but I think gardeners would tell you that's necessary sometimes for some plants to prune them back so that they can live. And that's what I think is going on here. God is pruning the earth, the world, so that he can save it. Like a cancer patient, the chemo will nearly kill him in order to save him. Maybe we could understand this chapter in that sort of light. That God is doing what needs to be done in order to save his creation. There is drastic surgery that needs to take place. A third answer that Wright gives, and I think this is, I think this is really what's going on here, is Wright says that these are a somewhat of a rerun of the Egyptian plagues. Now let me take you back to that story in Exodus. Do you remember that story? That story is referenced over and over again in the book of Revelation. And in that story, God strikes the earth, Egypt, with a series of plagues. But ultimately, He does that so that His people can be saved. And this is an indication that God, here in Revelation, is in the process of saving His people once again. Passover imagery, we see it again all over the book of Revelation. Even the Lamb at the center of the throne, the Lamb who appears to be slain, is a reference to the Passover story. You remember the plagues that happened in Egypt? God turned waters to blood. He then sent frogs, gnats, flies, each inflicting damage. Then a deadly pestilence struck the livestock. Then the people were inflicted with festering boils. Then thunder and hailstorms took out the crops. Then a plague of locusts, followed by darkness, covered the land for three days. Then the final judgment, Passover night. You remember the story? The angel of death passes through the land, kills the firstborn of every family and every herd. But the people of God were spared. They were saved. Why were they saved? Because they followed God's instructions to take the blood of a Passover lamb and to paint their doorpost. And the angel of death passed by. What happened next? Pharaoh had enough. He released the Israelites, but then changes his mind only to have the Red Sea collapse on his army. The plagues were a key part of God's rescue. So, with all of this in mind, John is talking about the rescue of God's people once again. The plagues here are not an exact match of the Egyptian plagues, but we hear echoes of the Passover story, of the salvation story, of God's people being redeemed once again. I think this is the point of Revelation chapter 8. As we read this the, these descriptions here, we see imagery all over the place. Let me just point out, point out just a few here. We read of a mountain being cast into the sea. What's all that about? How many of you remember Jesus using this imagery in Mark chapter 11? I'll put this verse on the screen. I tell you the truth, Jesus says, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Is Jesus, is Jesus really saying that literally we could say to a mountain, go jump in the sea, and the mountain will hop up and go jump in the sea? No. He's using imagery, isn't he? He's telling us we can do great things. The same imagery is used in Revelation chapter 8. Think of Isaiah. In Isaiah 14, Isaiah says this, How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star. Son of the dawn, you've been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. What's Isaiah talking about? Isaiah's talking about the king of Babylon here. And he's talking about God rescuing his people out of Babylon, bringing them back into the land. The great star has fallen. It's imagery here 
that Isaiah used and this same imagery is used in Revelation chapter 8. And the star in Revelation 8 has a name. What's the star's name? Wormwood. Now, for those of you like me who are uh, fans of C.S. Lewis, you might know that the name of the nephew in Screwtape Letters is what? Wormwood. And C.S. Lewis didn't come up with that, by the way. And John is not using this originally either in Revelation. In fact, the term wormwood is used in the Old Testament to describe bitterness and sorrow. It was a, there was a plant, a bitter plant called wormwood, and that's the imagery that's being used. We, we could spend hours going through all of this imagery and talking about ways in which what John is saying here in Revelation chapter 8 is found in other places of, in the Bible. And John's pulling it all together here. But what's the point of these verses? What are we getting at here? You see, the fire following the prayers of God's suffering people, being cast to earth, unleashing these catastrophic events. The point here is that the people on the earth, they, they have no concept of what God is doing. Now, the people, the Christians, who are living in the first century, they don't think that God's in charge. But He is in charge. They think that God is doing nothing about the injustices that they're seeing from day to day. But here, John is seeing this vision of God stepping into history, reestablishing His rule of heaven and earth. And this destruction that we read about in Revelation chapter 8 is only the beginning of God stepping in and making things right. Again, another Exodus story, another salvation story in which God is saving and redeeming His people. I think that's what Revelation 8 is all about. Now, if you join us next week, we're going to get it into chapter 9, and it gets even more weird, okay? Some really strange things in chapter 9. If you're on our email list, I'll email you this week. And I'll ask you to read that chapter before coming to worship. And you'll come with lots of questions next week. I promise you that. But I think we need to understand Revelation 8 as imagery of God coming and starting the redemption process again in the same sort of way that He's done in the past. And I think that's what's going on here. And you say, well, what do we do with these verses? I mean, what about us, you know, in 2019? How do we read this and find any application in our lives whatsoever? Oh, I think there's application here. I think there's application because as we read these verses, many times you and I are reading these verses and we're going, what? Is, what, what, what? A third of the earth? Stars falling out of the sky? Mountains being moved? This, what's all this about? Why is God doing that? And if we think about it, in our lives, we ask those same questions, don't we? God, what are you doing? What's going on in my life? Why this diagnosis? What's happening in my job? Why is my world falling apart? And often when we see turmoil in our own lives, we begin to question God, don't we? That's the first thing that we do. I said, why? Why are you taking me through this, God? Why, why am I having to endure this? But if we back away from Revelation chapter 8 and we see the whole story here, we can see that often when God moves and destruction happens and things get kind of turned upside down, God is in the process of doing something great. God is in the process of rescuing His people. God is actually in the process of bringing healing to His creation. Not just wiping it all out. And so when plagues come, when turmoil comes, when our life gets turned upside down, and we're having to deal with stuff that we don't want to deal with, we can remember that we serve a saving God. We serve a God who rescues us. Again, for the first century Christians, they would have been going, where is he? What's he going to do about this? People are being killed because they're Christians. It doesn't seem like Jesus is Lord. And all the while, they're reading this story and they're seeing God taking their prayers like incense, throwing them to the earth in the process of salvation. 
is starting. It doesn't look like salvation right now, but that's what it's going to turn into. The, the, the process of reclaiming the earth and restoring Eden as it once was has started. It doesn't look like that right now, but that's what's going on. Let me challenge you this week. As you read this story, and again, you, you think, hey, I came to church on Sunday and we read this weird stuff in the Bible toward the end of the book and it didn't make any sense whatsoever and I don't know what it has to do with me. Let me challenge you this week as you leave this place. Whatever, whatever's happening in your life, whether it's good or bad, whether it's something that is life-giving or something that feels destructive at the time, to, to trust that God is a God who saves. God is a God who heals. God is a God who rescues and that's what he's doing in Revelation. And that's what he's doing today. He's been doing it for a long time. If we read the story of God again, we've talked about this every week. But Revelation seems to be not just about some distant thing in the future. It's about what has been and what is and what will be. All at the same time. It's hard to wrap our minds around that, isn't it? But that seems to be what's going on here. Would you pray with me? God, we want to say thank you for the opportunity to gather and worship and to study your word. God, sometimes the Bible is challenging. Sometimes it's difficult to read. But God, as we have read this story and as we continue in this story, continue to remind us of who you are and what you're doing. And whatever we've got going on in our lives today, God, we lay before you and we trust you in that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We come to a time in our worship service where we'd like to give you the opportunity to respond in whatever way God would be prompting you to respond this morning. And so, this morning, the altar's open, and maybe this morning you'd like to come and offer prayer. And let me invite you just to get up during the song and walk to the altar and kneel and offer a prayer. Maybe it's for someone who's dealing with a difficult situation. Maybe it's for Christians around the world who are struggling. Maybe it's uh, for some particular world event uh, or something that's happening in your life. You come and offer a prayer now. Maybe this morning you brought an offering. Uh, this plate here is, here is here for you to come and to uh, give your offering as an act of worship. If you have given online and would want to signify that just as an act of worship, there's a green card here and you can just pick that up and place it in the plate. Maybe this morning you'd like to pray with someone else and uh, let me invite you to take the time to do that as we stand and sing together. Maybe, to, maybe this morning you'd like to come pray with me or make a decision of faith. Uh, I'll be here as you'd like to do that. Let's stand and sing together. <laughs>